hey, welcome today. It's an exciting day to be together. Um, we are in part five, the, the fifth and final week of a teaching series we've been in called Creating Margin. And I hope for, for some of you it's just been, uh, you know, really challenging, uh, maybe thought-provoking, uh, this idea of how do I create margin in my life? And so uh, we've been looking at two big questions, trying to ask them and answer them. Uh, number one is, uh, what matters that's missing? That's a huge question. If you think about your life, you know, um, there's all kinds of things in our life, all kinds of things that have our attention, all kinds of things that have our focus. But what is it that matters that's missing? What is it that matters that doesn't get maybe our best, maybe doesn't get, uh, you know, a lot of our focus, a lot of our time, a lot of our energy? What matters that's missing? The second question we've been looking at is, how do I make room for things that matter? How do I make room for these things? So it's not enough to just identify it. I mean, I think that's easy. That's easy for a lot of us to just begin to identify the things that matter the most. We can start to talk about, you know, our relationship with God. We can talk about, you know, our, our, our marriages and our kids. And we can talk about all these things that really matter the most. And yet the big question is, well, then how do I make room for that? How do I, how do I truly carve out time and, and uh, you know, give energy to it? And if you're anything like me, what I have found to be all too easy throughout my life, it has been all too easy for me to uh, kind of live in default mode kind of just coast, sort of autopilot, if you will, kind of just um, give whatever energy is available, whatever time's available to, to whatever I'm doing. And um, very rarely, I, I think throughout my life, have I, until, until recent, have I, you know, intentionally looked at how to give my very best to the things that matter most. And, um, and these, these are the, the thoughts. These are the big ideas behind this, this series. And so I want you just to dial in with me today, because we're going to kind of, kind of pivot a little and you know, maybe attack a different angle in, in how to create margin. And so I'm looking for some honesty and transparency in the house, all right? So uh, how many of y'all would say that, uh, that you occasionally or, or actually maybe, maybe quite often feel a little bit of financial stress in your life? Anybody just willing to just throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care? Yeah, uh, you go ahead, right? And now, now keep your hands up right now. Look, whoever doesn't have their hands up, just that's what a liar looks like, all right? So I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, I want to I want to take take a moment today, and uh, we're going to talk about um, what it looks like to create um, some financial margin. And and yet, what the message is going to sound like when you hear me preach this message, it's going to sound like a message that's about money. And really, it's it's a message about our heart. And in fact, like I've I've delayed this message. I was supposed to preach this message week three, and I pushed it off because it's um, it's actually one that that I, I've been. Uh, I don't know, uh, kind of fearful of preaching. It's not one that's really, ex um, and, and the reason is because there's a, because a lot of people uh, have this, this conception of church uh, that, uh, or this idea of church that all we want is your money. Or, um, or, or there's people with these viewpoints that, uh, you know, who are you to tell me how to spend my money? It's my money anyway. I think both those thoughts are wrong. I think both those thoughts don't honor God and and aren't, aren't the accurate biblical idea. And so we're going to look at, at, at a few things today, and it's going to sound like a message about money, but, but I promise you it's not. And that's not where it comes from. And so Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, it says this, says, This is what the Lord of, of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Anybody ever felt like that? Have you ever, ever had a time or two in your life where, you know, you're just, man, I thought I just got paid, you know, and uh, you're looking at your bank account and you're thinking, man, I, 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 what is going on here? I, I can, over, you know, nearly 13 years of marriage tell you there's been a number of times where, uh, you know, I thought that there was more money in the bank and, uh, than there was and, uh, you know, Lindsay and I maybe weren't communicating quite like I thought we were, and I get online, and it's Starbucks, 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 right, you know, and, uh, right, you know, you know it's true, so, uh, right, what, all from, all from, not from me, so, uh, and so I remember times thinking, man, what happened to all of our money, have you ever thought that, you ever been like, man, I thought I had way more than this, and sometimes it's quite like, like this verse in Haggai, it's, it's like these wages disappearing as though we're, we're putting them in pockets filled with holes. And so I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit today. I'm going to talk about the importance of why we need to create some margin. And uh, it, it's kind of, you know, it, it's a series uh, that we've been in, right? And, and it's the conclusion of a series today. 
Um, and so there's some really important principles that I, wa- I want you to grab today. And, and uh, you know, maybe this isn't a massive area in your life, but, but I think that the, uh, it's interchangeable. You can, you can, you know, pick out any kind of margin you really need in your life and enter it in there. Um, but the reason why I, I wanted to take some time on this is because I, I think that, that finance is money, whatever, is, is maybe the number one way uh, that, that most Christians find difficult to trust God. I think that when it comes to finances, I think that it is often the number one way where Christians struggle the most to trust God. And there's a quote years ago that I, I heard um, by a pastor named Craig Rochelle, and he says it like this. He says, what you fear the most is where you trust God the least. And if, I, if I'm honest with you, like, like this has been in my spiritual journey with God, the number one most difficult area for me to completely trust God. It's in the area of, of money, finances. Now, man, there's all kinds of other places. Like, you know, I, I, it's like easy to trust God. I'm like, of course, you know, it's out of my hands. I'm just, yeah, I'm going to trust God with this. And, and, and yet when it comes to money, when it comes to finances, it's been a difficult area in my journey to just completely trust God. And so... Again, I want to talk to you today about, about a message about money, but it's not really a message about money. I, I think that what we're going to talk about today is, is a message about our heart, that oftentimes it's, it's not a money problem, it's a spiritual problem. And, uh, you know, in our culture today, financial stress is completely normal, entirely normal. It's the number one cause of divorce. Did you know that? Number one cause of divorce is financial struggle. And what's interesting to me is that we find year after year after year people getting divorced, not because they, they don't love each other anymore, but, but because they can't figure out how to get along on how to spend money. Like, you know, we're either going to spend or we're going to save. Number one cause of divorce. What's normal in society today is financial stress. People living paycheck to paycheck is normal. Revolving debt is normal. Financial fear and anxiety, financial tension is normal. Having little or no financial margin is, is normal. And so we're in this series, right, and I'm talking to you about how to, how to create space, room, margin, for, for the things that matter most. And this is a really critical message that, that we tie up today. So the way we've defined margin as the, the space that exists between uh, what I have and what I need, right? So if I have $3,000, then $3,000 is what I have, right? That's, that's, that's what I've got. If, if I have $2,500 in bills and $2,500 is what I need, I've got $500 left over. That's my margin, right? And, and yet I've known a lot of people who have $3,000, or, and, and 3000 is what they have, and yet they need 3000 to pay their bills, and they have absolutely no margin. I've known people who have $3,000, that's what they have, and they need $3,500. They've got negative margin, right? And I don't know, maybe you felt like that a time or two in your life. And uh, I think maybe another way to define margin is, is when what you have is greater than what you need, you have margin. How simple is that? Right? You should write that down, Pastor Jordan. Uh, when, when what I have is greater than what I need, I have margin. And when I have more money than I need, I have margin. When I have more time than I need, I have margin. When I have more emotional capacity than what I need, I have margin. Are you tracking with me today? And so financial margin is, is, is simple. It's, this, it's, it's having money left over at the end of the month. Um, it's having money available to help someone who's in need. You know, that's a huge one. Like, like so often, I, can, I remember times of, of, uh, of really struggling in this area and, and actually being compelled to want to help. And, and I can tell you that one of the worst th- feelings I have ever had in my life is when I actually felt the Holy Spirit compel me to get involved and to help somebody in need and not have the margin to, to, to know how to do it financially. So financial margin is uh, money available uh, to give without feeling stressed, money available to uh, do something you enjoy, having money available to purchase some extra time margin. Have you ever, have you ever like, how awesome is that, right? You just need, I need more time, so because I have financial margin, I'm just going to purchase more time. I'm going to hire someone to mow my yard. I'm going to hire someone to clean my house. I'm going to purchase some time. That, that's financial margin allows things like this to happen. And what I'm finding is that, is that even though it is great, oftentimes 
uh, it is something that most people do not have. And what I have found is that just about everybody I know wants financial margin. Nearly everybody I know wants any, any sort of margin in their life. However, there seems to be this disconnect that exists between where we want to end up and the path that we choose. Do you know, know that to be true in your own life? There seems to be this disconnect between where we want to end up in life and the paths that we choose. Now, we're just talking about money, but you can talk about all sorts of things in that, in that, in that regard, right? There are a lot of people who, who want to end up financially secure. There are a lot of people who want to end up with enough money in retirement. There are a lot of people who want to uh, you know, have money to, to get involved in, in, in building God's kingdom and to bless others. There's a lot of people who, who want to end up with a healthy marriage. There's a lot of people who want to have a relationship with their kids as they get older and all of these sorts of things. But what I'm finding out is that there is a big difference between what I want and what I get. That what I want rarely ever gets me anywhere in life. Do you know that? It, it's true, like, like it, it really doesn't do much of anything to say, like, I want fill in the blank. It, it, it doesn't really ever get you anywhere. Having intentional thoughts is a lot different than making intentional decisions. You know, it, it, it was a, it's a series really on, on trying to get us to think more intentionally, and that's maybe the takeaway. I, I think it's a step further. I think it's a series on trying to get us to, to make intentional decisions with our life, to take action, to, to live differently. Most people that I know want God to bless them financially. Like, I, I want that. God, I, I want you to bless me financially. Most people want that, right? I sure, I sure hope so. Most people choose to give him nothing. Like, most people uh, do not want to live with financial pressure, and yet most people live beyond their means. Like, most People want to give money to help someone in need. You know, they see a need. They see a commercial. They hear a missionary come. They, they, they see a need. They, you're out at City Reach, and they, you know, they see someone without, without food, and they want to get involved. Most people want to help somebody in need, but most people spend all of their money on themselves. And I guess the, the thought here, right, is that, is that you will always end up where the road you're on takes you. So think about that thought. You'll always end up where the road you're on takes you. There has been this big disconnect for so many of us between where we want to end up in life and the paths that we actually choose. It's not enough to just have some intentional thoughts. I've got to make some intentional decisions. And one of the cool things there, you know, when, I, when I'm on a path, when I'm on a road, when I'm traveling, you know, in a direction in life and I, what I have found is that, is that oftentimes other people are the ones with the best insight into where the path I'm on is actually taking me. It, oftentimes I don't even see it clear, clearly. Oftentimes I need someone else who's outside of the situation to kind of give me their insight, give me their thoughts, because I'm emotionally connected to the situation. Man, I've, I've made my decision. I've spent my money. I'm living emotionally attached to what I'm you know, what, what I'm doing, I need someone on the other side, someone on the outside who can speak clearly to where my path is taking me. Now, we're talking about money, but, but for some of you in here, man, it's completely different than that in your life. There's something else. You need someone who can speak to you on where the path you're on is actually taking you. And one of the great encouragements for some of us in here today, and maybe one of the great words of caution to some of us today, is this thought right here. Where you're at isn't as important as where you're headed. That's a word of encouragement to some of you. Where you're at right now isn't as important as where you're headed. That's a word of caution to some of you today, that where you're at isn't as important as where you're headed, right? Where I'm at right now, you think about that. It's not as important as where you are actually headed. So if you're in a tough spot, if things aren't going well, if you're unsure how you're going to, you know, Make all of this work. It's not as important right now as you making intentional decisions to start to get on the path that's going to take you to where you want to be. Others, others of you, you're in a situation where, like, the dam hasn't broke yet. You know, you're, you're not in, like, massive trouble yet. But you're in a situation where if you stay on that path long enough, you're headed somewhere you're not going to want to end up. Where you're at isn't as important as where you're headed. This is why parents overreact. Did you know that? This is why parents overreact. Because we always react to where our kids are headed and not where our kids are. That's why that's how we overreact. It's like it's like 
Do not ever do that again. You're becoming like your father, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's like we react not to where they're at, but to where they are headed. My goodness, if you keep doing that, you're going to end up in prison, right? You're going to be, you know, however. And so we overreact, we overemphasize, we freak out, not because of what they just did, but because of where they will end up if they continue to do those things. I think that God is a lot like this. I think that God intervenes like this. I think God sees things like this. He's, he's not as interested in where you're at right now. He's interested in where you are headed, who you're becoming. Uh, if you're becoming more like him or not, right? I mean, what kind of love is that? God and, God and your mama. And that's incredible love to overreact, right? And care more about where you're headed than where you're at right now. I'm convinced that for most Christians, like, it's not a money issue. It's a heart issue. It truly is. Because, you know, the simple answer today, I could have got up and I could have been done by now if I, if I just got up and tried to address specifically financial margin. Because it, the simple answer to how to create financial margin is, is just to earn more and spend less. That's all you got to do. Just go get a second job, make more money, spend less, or, or whatever, you know. That, that's the answer to financial margin. That's the simple answer. And yet, and yet for so many people, that's not going to fix it. That's really not going to fix the issue because they'll make more money and they'll spend more money. There's a spiritual problem at, at the root of it all. There's a spiritual issue at the root of it all. And I can already kind of feel, to be real with you, like, you know, when you preach a message, you feel the, the, uh, you feel the, 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 the church, you feel the audience, you feel how, I can already feel the tension a little bit. Because it's a tough topic. It's an issue where you're like, oh, hey, you know, what are you, what are you doing, Pastor? Like, we're looking at a spiritual issue here, right? There's a famous story in Mark chapter 10. It's a famous, famous, famous story. So many of us have heard. And uh, it's, a, it's a story of an interaction that Jesus has with, uh, with a young man who has a lot of money. It's a story where, where Jesus speaks to him about the most important things and um, speaks to him about what is really going on on the inside versus what's going on on the outside. And in verse 17, it says this. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Man, I love that thought right there. I mean, that could be like a whole message, right? That could be a whole sermon just on like Jesus saying, Only God is truly good. Why do you call me good? I love that thought right there. But in I mean, I, like, why would we ever call ourselves good if Jesus doesn't even call himself good? It, it's just a whole thought. But um, in verse 19, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother, right? So these are some pretty significant Things And these are the Ten Commandments, right? And the guy says to him, teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. So you see a young man who's done a lot of good, right? We would look at him and we would say, man, that's a good person, right? If you haven't done these things, if you've kept these commandments, if you've, you know, not murdered, yeah, you're, yeah, you know, you're a pretty good person. If, we, uh, if you haven't committed adultery, you've not stolen anything, you haven't lied, you haven't cheated anyone, you've honored your parents, like, like man, that's a person, like, I want to be like. That's a person that, you know, we would want to hang out with and to be friends with. They have good character. Jesus looks at him and he speaks to this because the young man is basically saying, look, like, like everybody knows I'm a good person. Like, I've done all these things. In verse 20, 21, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. He says, there is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus is speaking to the issue of his heart. He's not speaking to the issue of his wealth. You understand? He's looking at the young man, and he's, he's, he's saying, man, you've done, you've done all this stuff. Like, everybody can tell. He says, but, but what you have done is you have become more, more interested in, in, in living your life in such a way that people can see that you're good instead of living your life in such a way that on the inside, God can see that you're good. Because there is something on the inside that's not fully surrendered. You're not completely given over to Jesus Christ. You're not completely given over to the Lord. It says in verse 22 that at this the man's face fell and he went away sad 
for he had many possessions. And I think that's interesting to me because it's, it's like a stark contrast to when the young man first approaches Jesus. He, he approaches him with this like excitement, right? He has this, you can almost picture the countenance on his face is like, you know, I, I can't wait to talk to Jesus. I want to know what I got to do. You know, I'm doing pretty good. I want to know what I can do to inherit eternal life. And he begins to have this interaction with Jesus. But by the end of their interaction, his entire countenance has changed. He's become downcast. The Bible says that his face fell because he was sad. What must I do? Jesus then, in verse 23, looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible with God. And what's amazing here is that these guys want to know specifically, like, you know, who can get into heaven? Who, who can make it? Who can, who, who's good enough? Who's qualified enough to get into heaven? And, and uh, you know, they're, they're like saying, well, surely, you know, someone who's kept their commandments is, is good enough, right? And, and, uh, and Jesus begins to speak to them and to talk to them about how difficult it is. To, to really get there. And he says that, uh, you know, he's, he's yet to reveal to them that the, the plan, that the mystery of the gospel is, is that he had come to earth to be the, the sacrifice, that he had come to earth to be the, the blood that would be shed for the forgiveness of the world and the sins of the world. And, 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 and so the disciples hadn't really seen that, that revelation yet. They haven't seen him share the mystery of the gospel. So they're saying, well, how, you know, who can really make it? How can they do this? And, and Jesus says to them, he says, uh, he says, humanly speaking, it's impossible. He's saying, like, you can't, there's nothing you can do to be good enough. Like, humanly speaking, it's impossible. He says, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Now, I love this story. It's an incredible story. It's a classic. I love the story because it, uh, it's, not, it, it's not really dealing with a money issue. It's dealing with a heart issue. I love, I love the, the focus in Jesus to, to look at this young man and to love him and, and to just pinpoint in him the, the real issue was an issue in his heart. What I have found interesting, you know, is that, you know, you can have a lot of money or you can have a little bit of money and you can have the same problem. It's interesting to me, you know, I, I've known, uh, you know, I could have two people up here, you know, I could have someone with a lot of money, you know, I could have someone with a little bit of money and, uh, and their heart condition could be the exact same towards money. I've known people who have a lot of money, and, and they're really not motivated by it. They, they could live with less and be just fine. It's not that big a deal. I've known people who have very little money, and it seems to be the only thing they can ever talk about or think about. They're consumed with how to get it. You know, they're, they're just, uh, um, I've known people who have very little money, and they're, so, they're, they're like um, some of the most, or some of the least generous people I've ever met. And, you know, I, I've also met people with a lot of money who aren't very generous either. So it's not really an issue of money. It's an issue of our heart. It's a spiritual issue. And so there's some things today, right, I want to I communicate with you. If, if you want to create some financial margin, you know, um, you, you got you to gotta be willing to protect your heart. You, you got to be willing to, to allow God to protect your heart in this area. And so if I want to protect it, I've got to create some space. If I want to protect my heart in this area, I've got to create some room. I've got to create some margin. Proverbs 21, 20 says this. It says, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Isn't that an awesome verse? I love it. I love it. There's two types of people in this verse Solomon's telling us about, right? There's the wise and the foolish. The wise person, they have more than enough. They store up choice food and olive oil. Now, that must have been a big deal back then. I think, you know, I could have some, some food and olive oil, you know, in my house, and I don't think you'd be too impressed, you know? Uh, man, I could just open up the cupboards. Like, wow, that's a lot of olive oil you got there. Uh, but, it, you know, it was a big deal, like, then, you know? And so it, it, he's talking about the finer things of life. He's talking about wealth and, 
And uh, Solomon's saying, you know, wise people have more than enough. He's saying, you know, wise people have margin. You know, there's other translations of this verse where it actually says, you know, in the house of the wise is stored up a choice food and olive oil in the house of the wise. And I, I love that idea because in, in, the, in, in the house of the individual, the people who, who are wise, uh, there is margin. There is more than enough. There is more than you need. But in the house of the foolish, uh, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They're devouring everything they make. They spend whatever they get. Do you, you understand? This is what this is scripture. It's not just my opinion. You know, it's saying that there's a difference between the wise and the foolish, those who have more than enough and those who don't. And what I what I love about this verse is I love what it doesn't say. Because it speaks to what, what it needs to say, but there's a lot of things that it leaves out that we oftentimes assume. So it, what, what it doesn't say is almost as, as important here. It doesn't say in the house of the wealthy is where there's margin. It doesn't say in the house of the, you know, the, the, the two-income family is where there is margin, or in the house of the six-figure income is where there is margin. What does it say? It says in the house of the, of the wise there's margin. It's saying that there, there is a way to live that is wise, and there is a way to live that is, that is foolish. And so I want to talk to you about how to create some financial margin. I want to give you a few practical takeaways, but, but why? What's, what's the point, right? What's, what's really the point? The reason, the reason why it's so important is because there are a lot of people in the kingdom of God who are unable to actually be used by God financially because they don't have any margin in their life. So they actually have good intent to get involved. They actually, they actually care about the things that, you know, or would tell themselves they care about the things that God cares about, um, but they're in no position to ever get involved. And uh, I don't know if you ever felt this way or not, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible, um, uh, it's an incredible feeling, you know, to, to uh, be able to, to, to actually give when God asks you to give. It's an incredible feeling to be able to, to get involved in the plans that God has for someone else's life. It's an incredible feeling to, to uh, partner with God to see his plan for someone else come to pass. It's, it's an incredible feeling. And there's a lot of Christians who are not in a position to be used by God, not because they don't have money, but because there's an issue in their heart. And so there's three things real fast I want to give you to tell you how to create some financial margin. And they're simple. And they're simple. They're easy. They're very practical. The first one is you got to kill comparison. You got to kill comparison. Ecclesiastes 6 9 says, Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. <laughs> right? We could just be good there. Enjoy what you have for once, you know, instead of looking at what you don't have. I think, I think that there's a lot of times where we see the blessings of God on our life, and we, you know, and, and instead of you know, fully really appreciating them and enjoying the blessings that God has given us. We've, we say, well, thanks, God, but, but is, there a re is there a reason why you haven't blessed me like you've blessed them? Like, is, there, is it possible that maybe you could also bless me like you've blessed them? And there is this problem of comparison in our life, and I think that comparison has caused mo most people to lifestyle their way out of margin, buying things they can't afford, spending money they don't have. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. And if you want to create, like, financial margin, like, for real, you've got to kill comparison. It's such a trap. It is, it is such a lie. It is such a, such a trap that gets us uh, caught up in a lifestyle that we can't keep up with. And, you know, it's, it's, you see something that somebody else has. You see a house that they have or a car they drive or whatever it is. And you're like, I got to, got to keep up and... You lifestyle your way out of margin, and when you don't have margin, you can't be used by God to impact somebody's life financially. We trade margin. We trade flexibility. We, flayed, we, we, we trade security and peace for material things that do not ever last. And so you kill comparison, and two, you cultivate gratitude. Easy, right? No? Uh, right? If I want to create margin in my life, financial margin, legit financial margin, I've got to kill comparison, and I've got to cultivate gratitude, right? Uh, it's, it's, is that one of the most difficult things to do? I mean, how, how often do we truly come before the Lord and just thank him for what he has given us? 
thank him for what he has done in our life. You want to get yourself in a position of having some margin, some space, some opportunity to be used by God in, in, in ways you haven't been used by God before, then you create margin by cultivating gratitude. I have more than enough. I've, I, I don't deserve what I have. God, I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for how you've come through for me. I thank you for your provision. I recognize that I did not create my circumstances, that you brought great things into my life, that you saw fit to bless me this way. I, I, I choose to, to not compare you know, what I have with what others have, and I just thank you for what I do have. You know, I have, I have friends who have, you know, a lot nicer things than me. I, you know, I have friends that have nicer houses than me. You probably do too. And, you know, I, I uh, you know, I look at, at, at what they have, and I, I mean, I'm so excited for my friends, right? I, I'm like, man, praise God. Awesome. Like, that's great that God's blessed you like this. I, I don't ever come to a place where I'm like, man, why, why can't God bless me like that? You know, there, there's, there's a problem in our heart when, when that starts to happen. We've got to cultivate gratitude. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says this. It says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Think about that scripture, that verse, first verse for a moment here. True godliness with contentment. So the two coming together is itself great wealth. Great wealth in the kingdom of God, right? In God's ecosystem, in God's economy, like great wealth is is uh, godliness, true godliness, living a life that pleases him along with contentment, cultivating gratitude and killing comparison, thanking God for the things that we do have instead of wondering why he hasn't given us the things that we don't have. Are you with me today? After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. In verse 10, incredibly famous words we're about to read together. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The most misquoted scripture, maybe in all of scripture, everybody says, you know, the uh, that money is the root of all evil. No, no, no. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Think about that. Think about what Paul is saying here as he's writing this letter to Timothy. Right? Think about what he is saying here. He says, you, you want great wealth in life? You want great margin? You, you, you want to be, you know, able to be used by God in incredible ways. He says, like, the, the way you really cultivate wealth in the kingdom of God, it's not by, by accumulating. It's not by building, you know, uh, bank accounts. True wealth in the kingdom of God is godliness combined with contentment. It's, it's, it's rejecting, having, you know, the love of money and the pursuit of money. He says some people craving money have actually wandered away from the true faith. I mean, think about that. Some people craving money, those who crave money have actually wandered away. They've got onto a different path, right? They, they, they've wandered onto a, to, to, to a, different, a different direction. You know, there's become this disconnect between where they want to end up and the path that they're choosing. And pierce themselves with many sorrows. You think about people who pursue money, they're just, you know, fixated on it, they need it. Um, you know, what are the sorrows that we see from people like that? Like, we see, we see lots of debt, don't we? A lot of financial pressure. We see people who are unable to enjoy the blessings they have because they're always worried about money. I can't enjoy what I have. Always worried about money. Don't have enough, you know? And, and there, is, there is true, it's true that there is times in your life where, I mean, you may not. Like, where you absolutely do have to depend on God and say, Lord, I need you. I need a miracle. I need you to break, you know, uh, break through in my life. But when I am always worried about money, that there, there has become a, an issue in my heart. I, there is something that I need to transfer over to him, some control in my life. There is some trust issues emerging in me. People who struggle to cultivate gratitude will always struggle to find financial margin. People who struggle to cultivate gratitude will always struggle to create financial margin. And so those are, those are some two, two really big ways. And here's the third one. Malia, you can come on up if you'd like. Here's the third one. 
The other way you create financial margin in your life is you put God first in your finances. Right? There, there it is. There the pastor was waiting for the last one, right? You put God, you put God first in your finances. And uh, I told you, like, this is a tough message. Like, it's, an, it's not an easy message as a pastor to preach because, like, it, it, this message, like, it's not about us. It's not about the church. Like, God, God takes care of it. God will take care of us. Like, it's about you. It's a message about you. It's a message about me. It's a message about my life, my family. It's about the blessing of God on my life. It's about trusting him in all areas of my life. It's about actually giving him control, letting him be in charge, letting him tell me what's important, letting my life, you know, follow him the way it needs to follow him. And so if I'm going to create financial margin, I've got to kill comparison. I've got to cultivate gratitude and I've got to put God first in my finances, right? This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths and eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. He says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And I love verse 21. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now, again, right, this, isn't, this isn't about us. It's, not about, it's about you. I've, told, I've said more than once this, this year, I've said more than once this summer, that you and I, we've got to be people whose heart actually beats for the things that God's heart beats for. You and I, we've got to be people who care about the things that God cares about. And it can't just be something we say. It has to be something we do, right? I mean, you think about this entire message, an entire series. There's been so many comments made about how we've got to live intentionally and how we've got to not just say, you know, we, we, we believe something or say something matters. We've got to actually do it. Man, my life has to matter for something. I've got to, I've got to make sure that the things that matter to God are the things that matter to me. It's not hard to figure out what matters to God. Scripture tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost that this world that is hurting and dying is the very thing that is, that is uh, on his mind, the very thing he is consumed by, the very thing he's concerned with. I've got to care about the things that God cares about. My heart has to beat for those things. Man, if I'm, if I'm getting too distracted by, by comparing my life to somebody else's life, you have to recognize the trap of Satan to get you to, to care about accumulating treasure here on earth instead of asking God how you can store up treasures in heaven. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. You know another way, another way that could be written? It could say that where your money goes, there follows your heart. That your money, your money actually leads your heart. Like it's actually out in front of it. It, it, it actually kind of has a leash around your heart, that, that where it goes, so goes your heart. Think about it. I love that thought. I mean, I want my heart to go towards God. I want my heart to follow Jesus. I want my heart to be in a good place. And where my money goes, there goes my heart, right? So, again, this message is for you. It's not for us. And there's some statistics I came across, and it's not to bring conviction. It's it's to, it's to bring conversation, right? The average Christian apparently gives about 2% to God. That means about 98% of what they make goes towards other desires, right? Other things. 98% of the average Christian's heart goes towards other things. 98% of their heart goes towards other things because where their treasure is there, their heart is also. All right, so 98% of my heart going towards other things. 2% of my heart going towards God. This is why the message that you've heard this morning is not a message about money. It's a message about our heart. It's a message that's not about a money problem. It's a message about a spiritual problem. And maybe you're here today, right? Maybe you, you don't have a massive financial issue. I teach us, right? <laughs> uh, maybe you don't, right? And I wonder how God would want to use you in someone's life. I wonder if God would want to use you to, to invest some of your wisdom into someone who's struggling to get this figured out. You and I have a responsibility to honor the, God, the Lord in all areas of our life, to be people of high character, 
to be good stewards of the very things he's given us. To not just sort of live and whatever happens, happens, but to live intentionally, to invest intentionally, to spend intentionally, to think about where the path we are on is actually taking us. Amen? Would you stand? Here's a question for you. If you continue on your current path, where will you end up? If you continue on your current path, where will you end up? Right, I mean, that's like the ultimate question at the end of a series like this, is if you continue on your current path, where will you end up? Where will your marriage end up? If you continue doing life the way you're doing life and living in default mode and not making intentional decisions, where will your relationship with your kids end up? Where will your finances end up? What about your relationship with God? If you continue on the path you're on, where will you end up? Where are you going to end up? Will you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning and uh, you, would just, you would just say, you know, Pastor Jordan, this is a big one. This is maybe one of the toughest areas of my life to give God complete control. And I want to begin today to start to, to hand over control um, and, and walk differently and, and make some big decisions to create some financial margin in my life. Could I just see your hand so I could encourage you with some prayer this morning? just want to encourage you with some prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for every person in this room under the sound of my voice. And God, I ask for courage to settle into this room. I ask for strength and encouragement to settle into this room right now. God, where, the, the, where, where uh, some may feel defeated and feel hopeless, I thank you that you have a solution. I thank you that there is nothing too big for you. And Lord, I thank you that as we keep our eyes on you, that you have this incredible way of providing for every need that we have. And so, Lord, I pray a rearrangement of priorities would take place in this room, that we would begin to place you in the proper spot you need to be in, that you would be Lord of our life and Lord of our finances, Lord of how we make decisions, Lord, of how we spend our time, and in all we do, God, that it would just honor you. I think the second question I'd ask you is, is uh, what are the things that you're not giving your attention to that are affecting the direction of your life? What are the things maybe you just avoid what are the, maybe the things you know are, are important, but they're not getting a lot of at, intentional attention? What are the things that are, that are, that are important that, that because you're avoiding it, because you're not addressing it, it's actually affecting the direction of your life? For some of you, it might actually be your relationship with God. You might be coasting right now. You might just be going through the motions. Some of you, man, it may be in your marriage, it may be in your home, it may be in your finances, but where are the areas of your life that you're not giving enough attention to and it's affecting the destination you're headed towards? And if you're here today and you would just say, Pastor Jordan, I just need more margin. It's not just financial, it's all kinds of margin. I just need margin. I need margin, margin, margin. Could you, could you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you today too. I just want to encourage you today. Father, would you just come into this place Father, would you just put your arms around every person in this room with their hand raised? Would you encourage them by the fellowship of your Holy Spirit? And God, I pray that you would help give decisions uh, to us, help give, give courage to us to make decisions to create room for the things that matter. God, I pray for intentional decisions to be made today, intentional decisions to be made as we walk out of here today. The, the commitment to say no to some good things so that we can say yes to some great things. The, the resolve to... Uh, not just live like everybody else lives, but the resolve to live differently, to chase a vision, to leave a legacy to our children and our grandchildren. And God, I ask for purposeful, intentional decisions and living to come out of this place. Lord, we want to honor you with our life. And so would you help us to create the kind of margin that we need? 
to live for you every single day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.